Hi everyone. So I'm bringing you another compilation video, if you want to call it that. Um, a good few people said that they liked the t like five missing men in Ireland, um, and I like those type of videos myself. So I just like said if you let me know if you want more of them. So you did. So here is another one. So I'm gonna do uh, stories on four hangings in Ireland. So from 1923 till 1954 we had death by hanging and then obviously it was abolished by kind of normal murder and then that was the last hangings anyway and then like capital murder it was kind of still there for that but nobody actually got hung and then that was gone as well the most you can get now is life so yeah let me know what you think of this one and i hope you enjoy on the grounds of mountjoy prison lay 29 unmarked graves for people who were hanged between 1923 and 1954. One of these was a woman. Their trials would all take place at Green Street Courthouse and once they were sentenced to death they would then be moved to the condemned cell which was on the D-wing of Mountjoy Prison. From this moment on two warders would be with them at all times to ensure that they didn't try to commit suicide. Another responsibility of the warders was to try to keep their spirits up. So they would give them cigarettes. The food would be a lot nicer for the last, you know, for their last days. They'd also be given, you know, books, newspapers, games like chess and stuff. Once the executioner arrived over from England, he would take sneak peeks in. There was like a hole in the wall and he would take sneak peeks in to try and measure the condemned so that the rope wouldn't be too long and too short because there were like drastic consequences to that. Essentially, if it is too short, the person will then die they'll be they'll just essentially be strangled and they'll die by strangulation so it'll be a horrific death and if it is too long there is the risk of them then becoming like beheaded so there's an art to the hanging so of the 29 people who were hanged john ellis done the first one he was the first executioner and then tom pierre point it's probably like pierre point uh pierre point he done 24 and then his nephew albert done the last four so I've already spoke about this a bit. If you have watched my video on the last man hanged in Ireland and the murder of Sister Katie, you will know about some of this already. Albert Pierre Point would have done that one. So you can go watch that if you haven't. Obviously, there's more information then again about the hanging and stuff like that. And obviously, that video is it's a horrific crime. That one really stuck with me. Um, and so you can go watch that if you haven't seen it before. So the first two I'm going to do are actually both called Thomas. They were both, uh, they both went to trial the same day and then they both ended up being hanged the same day. And that was the only time this has ever happened, like that two prisoners were executed on the same day or had their trials the same day. So I will just start with one and then the next. 48-year-old Thomas McDonough lived next door to 34-year-old Ellen Rogers. This was in Lock Lane in Roscommon and our story takes place in 1922. So the two neighbours essentially didn't go on. They had like had a falling out over a broken window. So I'm assuming one of them broke the window of someone else. Whatever happened, we don't really have a lot of information on it. However, on the 24th of May, Thomas went into his neighbour and asked her to go like for security. So as like essentially as guarantor for a loan of £130. Understandably, she refused. The next day, he went back and shot her dead in her home. Shortly after this, he gave himself up to an IRA policeman. So the Irish Civil War would take place from June 22 to May 23. So obviously, uh, like, hangings and all, all that were put to the side. They weren't important. So he was basically just put in custody until then, until he could have a trial. So on the 16th of November 1923, uh, Thomas McDonough eventually had his day in court. He tried to plead insanity, but it took the jury just 40 minutes to deliberate and find him guilty. He would be hanged on the 12th of December, 1923. The story of our next Thomas takes place in June, 1923. Thomas Delaney was a 28 year old laborer. He was an ex Irish guard and he had actually been injured in the great war. In Banagher, County Offaly, neighbors heard the cries of murder coming from 74 year old Patrick Horan's home. So he was a local shopkeeper in the area. When two men entered, they found Patrick bleeding badly and in the hallway stood Thomas with blood all over his clothes and his hands. He was also holding like a part of a broken tongue so I'm guessing like he used the tongs to stab Patrick and it snapped. As the two men grabbed him he exclaimed I am mad. 
On the 27th of June, he was uh, in trial and he would essentially say that when Patrick rushed him, he got so excited and then just doesn't remember happen what happened after that. And if you think that 40 minutes deliberation was short, think again. It took the jury just three minutes to find him guilty. And like Ariana Thomas, he was hanged on the 12th of December. Bernard Kirwin was born in 1908 in Galway. When he was two in 1910, his family moved to a farm in Ballincloggan, Rahan County Offaly. His father died when he was quite young in 1920. So... Bernard had two older brothers and a sister, and then he had one younger brother, Lawrence, who was about four or five years younger than him. He had basically been considered like the mother's favourite, and he would have helped around, you know, helped out on the farm. But as Lawrence obviously got older, then he bore like the brunt of the work. And I believe he resented Bernard for this. In 1934, Bernard applied to join on Garda Siakana, but this was rejected. And maybe that inspired him, because two years later, in 1936 he robbed a post office with a shotgun he was done for armed robbery and sentenced to seven years his mother died the following year while he was in prison and lawrence basically then took over the running of the farm he would hire a man called john foran to be like the farm hand and he would also live on the farm when bernard was released in june 1941 he first went to stay with his sister margaret conroy but then it was noted that like he wasn't great in the prison and like the warden or something tried to encourage him by kind of saying, why don't you, you know, you should go home and, you know, help help with the farm and this and that and stuff. So maybe that's why he went back then. He left his sisters and went back to the farm and Lawrence was not happy. It is said that Bernard basically didn't want to do any work. And so Lawrence refused to give him any money and he refused to feed him. So he started like locking the food away in cupboards and he kept his savings on him at all times or else while he was sleeping it would be under his head under the pillow there was a lot of animosity between them john foreign would obviously you know have witnessed a lot of this in late september they had a fight and lawrence locked bernard out bernard then like busted through the door and broke it in early october they had another fight it's it's said that maybe lawrence kind of instigated a fight um, but he ended up being stabbed in the hand. Now, Bernard would tell neighbours that he also got stabbed. But the brothers stopped talking then after this. And Bernard told neighbours, if he ever attacks me again, it'll be the last time. November 22nd, 1941, Lawrence was supposed to meet his girlfriend, Annie Flannery, that evening. But he never showed. John Bourne had actually been sent to Clara, also in Offaly, by Bernard to collect a watch for him that he had be he had gotten repaired. He arrived home close to midnight. He said that Bernard was wearing Lawrence's like, you know, um, work clothes essentially, and that there was food out, you know, on the table and stuff like that. And that when he commented on this, he said, "I'm the boss now." He would tell John that Lawrence was visiting an aunt, um, to help out on her farm or something like that in Kildare. Lawrence's bike was missing, but his car was still on the farm. Over the next day or two, Bernard would then send John off to do other things, you know, like to go to different towns and stuff to, so that he was out of the house. He essentially says that over that whole weekend, he was probably there about 15 hours and the majority of that was for sleeping. Due to the nature of the relationship, there was suspicions, obviously, when Lawrence, you know, wasn't being like seen around or anything. And... Bernard was obviously the main suspect. So on December 3rd, the Gardaí called by to talk to him. Bernard would say that he last saw his brother on the 22nd getting done up to go on the date with Annie. They would note that he was wearing a coat that was recognised as Lawrence's, but that it had been dyed black. Neighbours would later say that they had saw like black smoke coming from the house, you know, before, kind of the few weeks before or whatever from one of the outbuildings from the boiler there. So when Gardy searched, they actually found bone fragments. Bernard would obviously try to say like this, this was from animals or something. The Gardy left, it was, you know, kind of evident that Bernard thought or believed that it was John Foran who had talked to the Gardy and stuff. So he, he felt quite intimidated and threatened. So he actually left the farm that night and didn't go back. Lawrence's bike would be found then the following April, but there was still no sign of him. Until May 20th, 1942, when two bog cutters at Ballinacurra Bog came across a torso. 
The torso was in a sack that was like the ones used on the farm. So Bernard was arrested for the murder of his brother and his trial began on 18th of January 1943. There were 125 witnesses. There were kind of three things that they needed to prove. So one was that the body was Lawrence Kirwan. The second thing was that he had died, you know, by in a violent way. And that thirdly, that Bernard was responsible. So Dr. McGrath, the state pathologist, talked and he basically said, obviously, the, the torso was unidentifiable after being, you know, hidden for six months. But that it was clear he had been in a bog between three and 18 months. And there were no other missing men in the area since 1937. Obviously, then the way his body was found, you know, it was just the torso. And then the bone fragments being in the boiler house, they believed that the body had obviously been cut up, as would indicate a violent death. And then thirdly, just because of the nature of their relationship, you know, the way John Foran obviously would have then testified that he had been made leave, the, you know, the house over that weekend, that he was wearing Lawrence's clothes. Lawrence's wallet and like belongings were actually still in the house. And his wallet was actually found empty, hidden in a cupboard. One of the things that he got John Foran to head off and get was like a bottle of whiskey or something. So someone who had no money, all of a sudden had money. And so it would take this jury a little longer, at three hours, to find Bernard Kirwin guilty of the murder of his brother Lawrence. Bernard's story doesn't really stop there though, because while he was in Mount Joy waiting for his execution, Irish writer and playwright Brendan Behan was also here. And it is believed one of his most prominent work, uh, works, a play called The Queer Fellow, was inspired by Bernard Kirwin's execution. After the play actually then, you know, was, was on stage and stuff, it garnered a lot of sympathy from people about the whole situation of death sentencing and hanging. So in Ireland, actually, we when we became a free state, we didn't want to keep the capital punishment and, you know, death by hanging because it was believed to be very like that, an imperialist thing from the British Empire. And there was plans to, to you know, get rid of it. But then the Irish Civil War happened, so they just kept it and then it kind of just I don't know they just never really done anything with it after that up until the 50s but it was only shortly after this that then they did get rid of it for you know like common murder is what they call it and they say like it's not coincidental like that the Brendan's play would have influenced this and then of course the infamous song the L triangle a lot of people will sing it I've heard it many a time at a wedding Brendan Kirwan was then hanged on June 2nd 1943 so here is the last one for today. William Gambon and John Long met in the early 40s in St. Kevin's Hospital in Dublin. This was a voluntary hospital. William was there because he had injured his back in work. We're not really sure why John was there, but John was there for a significant time before William arrived. And it was said like he was actually, you know, he would do jobs and stuff under the supervision of the staff. He would go out and have a job and then come back. Both men were described as loners and they struck up a friendship while in the hospital, which would continue for many years after they both left. So in late 42 or, or early 43, William was discharged and he then went to stay at the Morning Star Hostel. In 1945, he would serve four months for larceny. And then in, in February 47, he would be charged with vagrancy, but he would just receive probation for this. After John left the hospital, he had lodgings in Church Street. A Reverend Robert Kerr actually helped him out financially. So he did, when he decided then to move on to England to work, he actually sent money back to the Reverend. He would also send money back to William. And this went on essentially from when he moved over until he came back when our story starts in 1948. He would do different jobs. He worked in like a jam factory. He was a labourer. And every Monday he went to the post office and sent by registered post money to William. And it could be anywhere from like, five shillings to a pound every week for like what five years in April 1948 William married a woman named Peggy so at this point he's 28 and John is 39 and in the summer uh, he received a letter from John saying that he was going to come back to visit in August before making the trip back by boat John withdrew his savings of £55 and he had these on him when he arrived at Dunleary Pier on the 21st of August 1943 and his friend William met him there. The two got the bus back to town. 
Now, William and his wife Peggy were living in like a like a room, you know, like a bed bed sit in five Upper Abbey Street. And it was decided that John was going to stay at the home, you know, he would put him up or whatever. But they're friends, right? And they would he wouldn't be able to stay if Peggy was there. So for William to get like rid of his wife for the night. He told her that he was going to go down to like Wicklow or something to spend time with some friends fishing or something. And so Peggy wouldn't stay there on her own. So she decided to go down to Cabaret to stay with her sister. So that meant he had the, the, the flat essentially for just the two lads that night. John was then surprised to hear that William had gotten married. Like for being friends, you don't seem to have talked about each other a lot or, or about other parts of your life to each other. William then told John that uh, Peggy was pregnant and that money was quite tight. John offered to give him, you know, some money and he said no because he didn't feel comfortable taking money from people. So then John said he would offer him five pounds for payment for putting him up for the night. Now, at 10 p.m., John was tired, so he got into the bed and the two men started playing pontoon, like a card game. They weren't drinking or anything and... At first they were playing like they were betting like a shilling and stuff like this and then but the game went on until the early hours and the stakes went higher. So by the end of the night or the end of the game John had no money left. William had won it all. At this point John got very annoyed and essentially accused William of cheating and that you know he cleaned him out. John like asked you know John demanded his money back. William denied cheating but offered half of it back as a compromise. Personally, I get the whole, oh, well, you won it fair and square or something. Like, I kind of feel like you were already getting so much money off him. Give him his money back. I don't know why, if you had no money, you were betting in the first place. Anyway, John wanted all of his money back. All of this is essentially on what William would say happened. So he said then that John got very annoyed. He called his wife a whore. He basically said that two of them tricked him into getting his money. He, John apparently threatened to get out of the bed and kick him in the guts. William said that he went mad then and so he he tried to like give John a dig but that his hand missed his head and hit the headboard and that at this point apparently John then went to grab his throat. So there was an iron bar on the wash bar basin beside the bed so William grabbed that and he says, you know he says it kind of got a bit hazy but he says that he used it to push John back onto the bed. He says he was sure that he did hit him because he saw blood stains. So William then covered his friend's face up and left. He says he doesn't remember leaving, he doesn't remember walking, but all of a sudden he was at Cabra. So bear in mind, it's essentially the next day. By this point, early morning. And so when he got to his the house in Cabra, when he arrived, he was told like, no, they had left to go to mass. That was fine. So he kind of hung around, but then he was told that they were actually going to go to Bray afterwards. So he left. So we don't really know what he done then for the day. We do know that he went and bought a padlock and went back and put it on the door so that his wife couldn't get in before he had the chance to talk to her. That evening then, he arrived back to the cousin's house with two boxes of chocolates for his wife and her cousin. His wife saw the mark on his hand and asked what happened and he said that he had gotten into a fight with someone. He said it was all going to be fine though and he gave her um, a few pounds. He then treated the wife and the cousin to Cathala's ice cream parlour in the city centre. They then went to the Fun Palace on Eden Quay and played the slots. Then they all went back to the cousin's house and stayed there. Just for context, Abbey Street and Cabra are not that far. I don't know why you wouldn't have just gone back to your own house. I don't know why that was not a question. Anyway, people stay over in people's houses, fine. The next morning at 9am, William leaves. And at 5.30pm, a letter arrives for his wife. And this says that he killed a man. So she heads to her parents' house, gets her sister Ada, and then her and her sister go back to Abbey Street. And when they see that there's a padlock on the door, they go around to the back of the house and climb through the window. And there they see there is a body in the bed and that there is a foul smell. So they go straight to the Gardaí. When the Gardaí arrive, then they obviously bust open the door. And when they go in, 
there is the body, the dead body of John Long in the in the bed. His face is completely beaten and the blood has soaked through from his head down through the pillow, the mattress, and there's now a pool of blood under the bed. They can see from his post book that he should have had 55 pounds and, you know, his wallet was empty. His shirt had also been ripped open, like torn open, and they believed that this was to check for if he had money hidden on him. So the Guardian then released a press release asking for, you know, um, information on the culprit or anything like that. And the following day, then on the 24th, William arrived into the Garda station with the newspaper press release. The Guardian then said, are you William uh, Gammon? He said, yes. And they said, are you turning yourself in? And he said, yes, there is nothing else to it. When he was like being cautious or whatever, he, he pointed out that it says malice afterthought. And he was like, no, I didn't mean to kill him. I had never intended to kill him. He had £39 cash in his pocket. He would go on to say that John Long was the best friend I ever had, you know, and essentially throughout his trial would say, maintain, like, I didn't mean to do it. You know, I would never have killed him. He's my friend, my best friend. But I kind of feel like he was just someone you used. And even after you killed him, you then, like, went through his dead body to see if he had more money. Like, on the 24th, when he went in to the garden station, he had like a brand new raincoat and a brand new trilby and stuff. So like he was spending the money of his dead friend or his because he won it. So his trial was on the 1st of November 1948. And it was actually Judge Davitt, who was the son of Michael Davitt, who was the founder of the Land League. This was an interesting fact. So the state pathologist, Dr. McGrath, would say that he had bl uh, four blows. John Long had four blows to his head and each one of these fractured his skull. When asked the position the head was in, he said it was in like it was consistent with a sleeping position when you're lying on the side. The trial went on for three days and he was found guilty and sentenced to hanging. His counsel would actually want to, you know, um, appeal, you know, you can do like a reprieve. And he said no. And it said that he he basically said, I have no future in this life without my friend. Reports would be done, you know, ahead of the hangings and stuff. And the medical officer of Mount Joy essentially called him a degenerate with a low sense of morals. And on the 24th of November, William Gammon was hanged. He would be the second last man hanged in Ireland. As I have spoke about in one of my previous videos, Michael Manning would be the last man. So if you haven't watched that video, I suggest you go do. But again, it's it's a heavy one and it does discuss um, sexual assault. So there is just four cases of different things of the men. I'm gonna cover more again um, and we'll put the woman in the next time, you know, equality and all that. So, and it's interesting because obviously that's why there was only one woman killed because it was kind of deemed as like we're the lesser sex, we're the fairer sex. So, oh God, no, you can't hang them. You know, this type of thing. But I'm just gonna leave with um, a little snippet and see what you guys think. Let's open up a little conversation. The former president of the High Court opened the conversation up about reintroducing the death penalty or, you know, there being a harsher penalty anyway for certain crimes. And so he essentially said, if someone chooses to arm themselves, go out and rob and like indiscriminately kill anyone who gets in their way, they should pay the price. And obviously some people would just outright disagree with the death penalty. But it, again, it does open the conversation as to what can be done then to, you know, deter people from committing these horrific, horrific acts. Let me know what you think. Do you think, I know we've done it in a live before, but sure, let me think, let me know what you think. And if you don't agree with the death penalty, what else do you think we can do? Because obviously our life, we know our life sentence isn't very good. It is getting longer, you know, but does it need to be kind of life with a minimum of 30 years, something like that? So, yeah, let me know what you think. I have a few interesting cases coming up over the next few weeks, so please keep your eyes. So, yeah, let me know what you think of this case and stuff, and we shall see you all in the next video. Thanks. Bye.